Okay. Very good. Thank you. We'll call the meeting to order. And uh, could we start with the closed session report from the city attorney? All right. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and members of the City Council. In closed session, the City of Simi Valley City Council authorized the City Attorney's Office to initiate a lawsuit to attempt to recover property damage incurred by it against Jonathan Clark by a vote of 5 to 0. In closed session, the City of Simi Valley City Council also authorized the City Attorney's Office to initiate another lawsuit to attempt to recover property damage incurred by it against Chica Anwar by, the vote, by a vote of 5 to 0. That concludes my closed session report. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rocky Rhodes, could you lead us in the pledge? Roll call, please. Council Member Loevenos? Here. Council Member Kavanaugh? Here. Council Member Judge? Here. Mayor Pro Tim Litster? Here. And Mayor Mashburn? Here. Agenda review. Everybody take a look at the agenda. Any comments? Yes, Mayor, we do have one supplemental item for agenda item 9A. It uh, provides some uh, uh, co uh, re revised contract language on hold harmless and indemnification within the contract that was prepared after um, the staff report was dis distributed. Okay, thank you. I move, I'm sorry. Sorry. I move that all resolutions and ordinances presented tonight be read in the title only and all further reading be waived. Second. Motion and second. Call for the vote. Motion passes unanimously. Declaration of conflict. If any member of the city council may have a conflict of interest or any reason why that member must abstain from consideration of any matter on this agenda, he or she should so declare at this time. Anybody need to? Mayor, I have, I have a question. Um, for item 5B, I know we have two council members that are on the Police Officers Foundation Board of Directors. On it does. What? I'm we, sorry. We do have two council members that are on the Police Officer Foundation Board of Directors. Okay. I know that uh, in the past they have used funds to purchase equipment. I'd like to know if any of the POF funds were used to purchase surplus military equipment that's on agenda item 5B, and if so, that uh, council member judge and council member Kavanaugh recuse themselves on that item due to conflict of interest. Okay, I'll defer that to the city attorney. Well, I don't know the answer as to specifically whether or not any of those funds were used. Perhaps the chief or Richie Lou might be able to answer that question. You, you, you might need to come to the dice. Yes, uh, as far as I've researched, I, none of that equipment has been purchased through the foundation. Most of it has been purchased through grants, um, donated, or uh, forfeited assets. Okay, uh, can we ask the individuals? In my 20 years on the board, I don't believe we have purchased any of that military grade equipment. Okay. I have no comment. And other than that, I don't see a legal conflict of interest. I've had a chance to thoroughly research it since it was brought up last time, and my opinion hasn't changed. Okay, and, and I've, I was on that board for many years, and I, I think everything we've heard here is very accurate. So. I request a follow-up report for transparency and accountability to be sure, since you're not sure. Okay, that would go to the... Uh, What? I'll bring it up on 5B. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Thank you. Okay, any other uh, 
declaration of conflict. Seeing none, moving forward. Mr. Mayor and member of the City Council, the first item on the agenda is item 1D1, presentation of a proclamation declaring the week of May 15th through May 21st, 2022 as Public Works Week. And Ron Fuchiwaki is here to read the proclamation. Good evening, Mayor Mashburn and Council members. It is my pleasure to uh, read and present this proclamation declaring Public Works Week. Whereas public works facilities and services provided in our community are an integral and essential part of our citizens' daily lives, and whereas the support of an understanding and informed citizenry is vital to the efficient operation of public works systems and programs, such as water, sewer, public buildings, streets, highways, and flood control, and whereas the health, safety, and comfort of this community greatly depend on these facilities and services, and whereas the quality and effectiveness of these facilities, as well as their planning, design, construction, and maintenance depend on the efforts and skills of public works personnel, supported by the public's awareness and understanding of the role of these public employees. Now, therefore, the week of May 15 through May 21, 2022, is hereby pro proclaimed Public Works Week in the city of Simi Valley to encourage all citizens and civic organizations to acquaint themselves with the issues involved in providing public works facilities and services to our community and to recognize the contributions which public works personnel make toward our health, safety, comfort, and quality of life. Presented this 16th day of May, 2022. Thank you. Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council, the next item on the agenda is item 1D2, presentation of a proclamation recognizing the observance of Arbor Day and declaring the week of May 16th through May 22nd as Simi Valley Arbor Week. And Stratus Peros is here to read the proclamation. Good evening, Mayor Mashburn and City Council members. We are delighted to announce that the Arbor Day Foundation has once again recognized the City of Simi Valley as a Tree City USA. We are privileged to have a representative from the California Department of Forestry, Forestry and Fire Protection here tonight to present an award on behalf of the Arbor Day Foundation in recognition of the City of Simi Valley achieving Tree City USA certification for the 22nd consecutive year. First, I would like to present this proclamation to the Mayor and City Council, designating this week as Arbor Week. Whereas in 1872, the first Arbor Day was observed with the planting of trees, and whereas trees are a source of renewal, add value to the urban landscape, moderate temperatures, clean air, produce life-giving oxygen, and beautify our community. And whereas the City of Simi Valley is dedicated to enhancing and preserving the urban environment, and in recognition of its commitment, has been named for the 22nd year as a Tree City USA by the Arbor Day Foundation. And whereas the Simi Valley City Council encourages residents and local businesses to support the expansion of the urban landscape by planting trees. Now, therefore, the week of May 16th through May 22nd, 2022, is hereby proclaimed Arbor Week in the city of Simi Valley to encourage all residents and businesses to plant trees, to enhance the beauty of Simi Valley, and promote the well-being of this and future generations. And next, uh, we will welcome Cal Fire Representative Henry Herrera to come up and present the city and the mayor with the Tree City USA flag. I think they have, they have a mic. Good evening, and thank you for inviting me to be part of your city's Arbor Day observance. My name is Henry Herrera. I'm the regional urban forester for Ventura and Los Angeles counties uh, for the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, CAL FIRE. The Arbor Day Foundation recognizes cities for their commitment to trees through the Tree City USA program. 
For a committee to be designated as a tree city USA, it must meet four fundamental components. It must have a tree board or department, a tree care ordinance, a community forestry program with an annual budget of at least $2 per capita, and an Arbor Day proclamation and observance. Since 2000, the city of Simi Valley has shown its dedication to restoring, enhancing, and maintaining your community's urban forest by meeting or exceeding the Arbor Day Foundation standards. CAL FIRE supports and delivers the Arbor Day Foundation's Tree City USA program in the state of California. As a CAL FIRE urban forester for Ventura and LA counties, it is with great pleasure that I recognize city, Simi Valley city officials, staff, and partners for their hard work to improve the quality of life for their citizens. I'm honored to be here with you today to celebrate Simi Valley's Tree City USA designation for the 22nd year. Congratulations. Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council, next on the agenda is item two, public statements on appointments, special presentations, and informational reports. And there are no speakers tonight for this. Next on the agenda is item 3C1, informational presentation by Youth Council member Krish Kotia. And Kristen Tignak is here to present this item. Krish is going to take it away. Good evening, Mayor Mashburn and members of the City Council. First, I'd like to preface this report by saying thank you so much for allowing me to speak this evening and for your continuous involvement and support of the Youth Council. My name is Krish Kotia, and I'm a sophomore at Santa Santa High School. I'm a rookie on the Youth Council, with this being my first term. It's been an exciting and memorable year so far, but we're not done quite yet. To start off, our last two meetings were held at the Rancho Simi Recreation and Park District Activity Center. Thank you to the Park District for their hospitality in hosting us and for the amazing back-to-back -back pizza and taco dinners. It made all the members very excited to say the least. We received a tour of the facility as well as brainstormed ideas for potential areas where youth-centered activities can be held, such as a gaming center with the newest technology offered, giving an opportunity for any teen or child to enjoy some quality time with friends in a safe and motivational envir environment. <clears throat> Sorry. Furthermore, we receive informational presentations from organizations and companies in our community, including STS Education and the Ronald Reagan Presidential Institute and Foundation in regards to summer opportunities they were offering. On April 30th, the Youth Council and Youth Employment Services simultaneously staffed a booth at the Simi Valley Street Fair. The Youth Council held a two bracelet making service project within this booth where decorative beads and strings were provided to any community member interested in making a bracelet. Along with that, the volunteers provided handouts with information on YES programs, as well as information pertaining to youth council events, such as our upcoming talent show. To complement our booth, we had the amazing and creative display of a Lego bouquet of flowers and Lego vase, made by two of our very own youth council members, Ricka Tignak and Jordan Downey. Colorful balloons were donated by the YES Advisory Board Vice Chair Gloria Bowman. The volunteers had lots of fun hosting the booth, including myself but I think we can all agree that the most difficult aspect of holding the booth was learning to tie the slip knots, which we tied for the children and adults after they finished decorating their bracelets. Thank you to the Simi Valley Chamber of Commerce for hosting and organizing such a fun and successful event. Now, while we're on the topic of events and initiatives, our Mental Health Awareness Committee, which I'm a proud member of, has launched a social media campaign for the month of May. We will be frequently posting mental health-centered content on our social media platforms, which include Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Along with that, our other committees, including the School Infrastructure Committee and the Sexual Assault Prevention and Awareness Committee, have been hard at work, 
and are in the process of collaborating with the district and school board to develop incentives that can be launched in order to counter issues which students may face at school. Now, directing your attention towards the big event we have coming up, I'm proud to announce that on Friday, May 20th, will be the fourth annual Simi Valley Community Talent Show and Silent Auction. Doors will open at 6 p.m., with the show starting at 7 p.m. at the Simi Valley Cultural Arts Center. Thank you to the Cultural Arts Center for their hospitality and generosity in allowing us to utilize this most beautiful facility for the event. The talent show will spotlight the gifts and exceptional abilities of select local teen adult and artists as they perform on the main stage. Over 15 individual and group acts will compete, along with non-competitive showcase acts from the community. And who knows, maybe the youth council may throw in a little surprise performance, but I've already said too much. Our talent show committee, Jake, our talent show committee has been hard at work organizing this event. Committee Chair Jacob Salvanera states that the talent show is a great opportunity for performers to showcase their events. And what better place to gain experience than on the main stage in front of a live audience? Cash prizes will be awarded in specific categories, in addition to a People's Choice winner. Discounted early bird tickets are now available for purchase through this Wednesday, May 18th, at $6 for students and $12 for adults. On May 19th, tickets will be $8 for students and $15 for general admission. Tickets may be purchased at tinyurl.com slash, in all caps, YC Talent. If any businesses or individuals would like to donate a silent auction item or help sponsor prizes for the talent show winners, please email youthcouncil at simivalley.org. All the funds accumulated for this event will help support the Youth Council's community projects and events throughout the year. These include the anti-bullying and anti-suicide prevention campaigns, the annual flagship event, the Simi Valley Youth Summit, and much more. We look forward to a successful and fun event where the audience can come together to witness the sheer talent our community has to offer. To spotlight other youth council fundraising efforts, we are still selling Jamba Juice buy one get one free gift cards for $10 each. These gift cards can be used a total of six times at any Jamba Juice location nationwide. To end off on an even higher positive note, I know that last month Ian already pointed this out, but I have to keep the tradition alive. Make sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Simi Valley Youth Council to stay updated on um, upcoming events and service projects that you can be involved with. Thank you so much, Mayor Mashburn and members of the City Council for having me. It was an honor to present to you, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions you may have. First of all, thank you very much, Chris. Great report for a so-called rookie. <laughs> we appreciate that. I have a question. Maybe it goes to Kristen. Uh, if someone's going to come, can they bring a check and are you a 5013C? So, um, actually, we um, there is a tax um, deduction that you can declare because it's public um, going into public funds. So that is available um, if you wanted to sponsor. Otherwise, tickets are available online. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Comments from anyone? I too have a follow-up question. Can tickets be purchased at the door? Can they, if I'm yes. assuming they're not all sold out? Um, yes, even though I do, would recommend the buying the tickets early because I know our first live show we did sell out. So I recall that. It did sell out. Well, I only want to mention that just in case someone doesn't manage the URL code or something. But okay. We don't want to discourage anyone from missing on a great and, night. And right now it's it's neat because the new ticketing system allows you to actually pick your seat. So it's not actually general admission. So we're excellent. So yeah. if you want to be in the balcony, you can you can be yeah. there, but you need to pick it. Yes. I love it. I love it. Um I just want to make sure pe do people notice that Chris is a sophomore and this gentleman's got a couple more years of amazingness ahead of him. So we appreciated your you, all that you've done for us and all that your presentation is excellent. And what I took away from your um, presentation is it sounds like the parks, uh, Santa Santa Park system is buying our youth council off with, uh, with meals. Is that is that your is that your takeaway or? They're just being generous. Just being generous. Okay. I, <laughs> no, I actually I think it's I, it's excellent that they are um, are reaching out and uh, appreciating the work of the youth council. And my other takeaway was that um, that. You sp that, the, that the youth council spans the gamut, everything from important mental health issues, which you were which you were part of that committee, to learning to tie slip knots. So clearly, it's a you learn lots of diverse things you get involved with. So anyway, thank you, Chris. Appreciate your presentation. Thank you so much. Hey, Mayor, I have a couple of questions. 
Okay, so what is the deadline for buying the Jamba Juice carts in case people want to buy them? You know what? There is no deadline. So as long as there is a need, we can get the cards. Okay. Um, and then they don't, they don't, their expiration doesn't start until you actually get your first, until you register your card. So. Nice. Okay. I'll reach out to you. Um, <laughs> the the um, second comment was with regard to the talent show. Can people still sign up um, to participate or is that deadline passed? Um, so I believe that we may have one opening, and the final day to do that would be May 22nd, which is, of course, this Wednesday, so not a really big time period. Um, that's what the Talent Show Committee chair said. However, um, I would not be 100% certain, so I'll definitely have um, our youth council coordinator to get, to get okay. back with you. Yeah. And we, we, could take an, we could take more acts, but um, the sound check and run through is Wednesday night. Okay, yeah. and I just wanted to make sure in case, because someone asked me, what's the deadline? I said, I don't know. I'll ask. Okay, um, last but not least, I want to thank you, the Youth Council, for, again, leading the way. It's tough, um, tough times right now uh, for, you know, our youth in terms of, you know, what's happening with violence, with the community, with, you know, mental health issues. So thank you for, yet again, taking the lead, providing activities for our youth. Uh, providing that support structure. I'm really excited about the gaming room. I know a lot of <laughs> our teenagers are excited about that. And you guys are really filling the gap um, because there seem to be a lot of stuff for younger kids, but not much for our teenagers. So thank you for partnering with RSRPD to do that. And um, just for all the work that you guys have done, tackling really tough issues like sexual harassment and bullying and uh, discrimination. So thank you. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Chris and Kristen. How did you guys get those names so close? <laughs> Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council, next item on the agenda is item four, public statements. During this agenda item number four, the City Council will hear public statements from the first 10 persons who have submitted speaker cards. After the first 10 persons have spoken, subsequent persons who submitted speaker cards will be called to speak again during agenda item number six, which is a continuation of agenda item number four. Agenda item number four and agenda item number six are the times allotted for public statements on all items other than public hearings, appointments, and informational reports. Speakers will be called on in the order in which their card was submitted to speak for this public statement item four for a period of no more than three minutes each. Persons addressing the City Council are requested to state their name and community of residence for the record. Mr. Mayor, unless you have any comments, we will begin the public statements. The first speaker is John Lapper. Mayor Mashburn and City Council, my heart goes out to the victims of two horrific, hateful shootings one in Buffalo, New York, and the other in Laguna Woods. Sincere prayers for all involved. A shout out to Simi Valley Cultural Arts Center. My wife and I attended the performance of Something Rotten on Saturday. A great performance, and the Arts Center is definitely a hidden gem in Simi Valley. Another great shout out to the Simi Valley Planning Commissioners. What a reassurance watching Rice, Hodge, Tolson, and Gray ask all the right questions and totally do their due diligence with research and focus on those making presentations and comments. I only wish our city council could learn from their meetings, and I would encourage all commissioners to run for city council. And another shout out to Rancho Simi Recreation and Park District for receiving the Transparency Certificate of Excellence from the Special District Leadership Foundation in recognition of its efforts to promote transparency and governments. A special note was the willingness of allowing Zoom comments so all residents could be heard, especially those unable to attend an evening meeting. Sadly, this goes contrary to our city council's viewpoint as they voted down Zoom comments or at least having submitted comments being read at council meetings. Thank you to our youth council. I have so enjoyed their presentations and efforts at the city council meetings. A big disappointment for our city council, ignoring almost 400 CME residents who complained about the ongoing fireworks problem in Simi Valley. Also a disappointment that our city council shelved any discussion on cannabis dispensaries in Simi Valley 
based on the split of opinions from 46 neighborhood council members and discounting other viewpoints in a town of 125,000 people, especially as all other Ventura County cities have or are moving towards some type of cannabis retail sales. And finally, the best for last, Councilman Mike Judge. Judge wrote a letter to the CME Acorn paper supporting a no vote on measures A and B. The part that bothers me is that we have a councilman on the dais making decisions for our city, and with A and B, he is basing his votes on lies, saying if it passes, they would shut down local oil and gas industry, result in cuts to all public services that include public safety budgets, and would result in thousands of local job losses are blatant lies. <clears throat> yes, and A and B is about safe drilling in the 21st century to provide safe water for residents and agriculture. Nothing new for Judge, as for 12 years, he has ignored Simi Valley's concerns with the Santa Susana Field Lab cleanup. <clears throat> Did Mike Judge receive campaign contributions from no on A and B committee? Simi Valley cannot afford four more years <clears throat> of Mike Judge bias. Thank you. Next speaker is Tarek Rizkala. Thank you, Mayor and City Council members. Uh, first time here, so pardon me. I'm not as ready as all these other folks ahead of me. Uh, I am a 32-year 32 32 year resident of Simi Valley. I am a board member, along, uh, along with other board members of our community, uh, the Oaks at Wood Ranch. And I'm here to just raise one topic, one topic only, the growing uh, street vendor population in Simi Valley. Um, currently, we have had a new one popping up at the corner of Long Canyon and Wood Ranch Parkway. Um, the police have been out there a few times to make sure that he's not breaking any laws, which, you know, he does stand off to the side, but, you know, he's gathering crowds around him. We've got vehicles that are parking uh, backwards adjacent to him on the side street. Uh, people pull over, people are distracted. But the bottom line is this is a residential community that's maintained by at least a minimum of four uh, associations. Uh, our association has 89 homes. The association across the street has, way, you know, fourfold that number. Um, we pay for the medians to maintain them. We pay for the landscaping and, this, and you know, if our landscapers see things on the sidewalk, they clean them up. The bottom line is this is an increasing problem and we'd like to know what can be done about it. That's it. Next speaker, Joe Pachowski. Before you get started, Joe, I, I want to make sure the gentleman prior to you understands that of we course. can listen because it's not your item is not on the agenda. We're not allowed to have discussion with you. So we sit here and look at you, and you're probably going, why don't they say something? And it's because based on the uh, Brown Act, which is a California state law, we're not allowed to. So please understand that we're not being rude. We're just obeying the law. Thank you. Okay, Joe. Good evening, Mayor Mashburn, members of the City Council. Let's talk about water. Last, last week, um, I was here, as, as were others, and we watched as our city passed a, a rather restrictive, uh, I guess it was an ordinance, restricting watering to one day a week in Simi Valley. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm all for conservation, but... From the moment I stepped out of the council chambers last Monday night to several days later, I was kind of surprised. Well, first, as I walked out of the building, the sprinklers in the parking lot across from the flagpole were going off in direct contradiction to the uh, restrictions that are already in place, which is strict ordering to either Tuesday or Wednesday, and Saturday or Sunday. Monday's not included in that. The city needs to be, needs to be held accountable to the same restrictions as, every, as everybody else. Second, within a day or two of the meeting, I had the news on. 
I tend to watch Fox 11. Mayor Garcetti from the city of Los Angeles, our neighbor, was on, and he was touting how residents of Los Angeles were going to be restricted to watering their lawns two days a week. Keep that in mind for a second. We're a little, by comparison to, to, to LA, we're a whole lot smaller. Then today, I learned that our neighbor to the northwest, the city of Santa Clarita, is allowing their residents to water three times a week. Now, it may, be, may just be me, but it's great that we, it's, it's, it's a good thing that we're limiting water to, watering to one day a week, but it's not going to do a darn thing when the city of Los Angeles is letting their residents water two days a week and a city about the same size as ours to, to the northwest, Santa Clarita, is letting their residents water three times a week. It's about fairness. It's about fairness to our residents, and, and everybody should be, everybody, water is a regional issue, and everybody in the region should be required to uh, be put into, under the same pain threshold. And so uh, that's something to think about. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council, next item on the agenda is item 4A, City Council comments regarding public statements. Mr. Mayor, you may begin. Thank you. Uh, council member or Mayor Pro Tem Lipser, someday I'm going to get that right. <laughs> not a problem, not a problem. Just quickly working backwards, Mr. Pichowski, Thank you for your comments about water. I think it's we need to do a better job educating people, understanding that unfortunately, almost all of our water comes through the California state water system and LA, much of their water comes through the, Cal to the Colorado aqueduct. They have, in essence, more water access. But nonetheless, it, uh, it, you bring up the, the question of fairness, and I concur that that's something that we need to discuss further. But I think that I understand Governor Newsom may be coming forward with statements for the entire state that will make it very clear what, where we stand with that. Mr. Riscala, I hope I'm close. Um, thank you for your comments. I've had several constituents echo similar concerns. I know that the police department is working on a presentation to codify and to be very clear of what, what the laws are with regards to what is and is not allowed. So I, I anticipate that will be coming soon. Mr. Lapper, we missed you last week. You, uh, you were clearly weren't here. Um, um, I always um, appreciate your comments, and I will tell you I concur with your uh, great performance at the Cultural Arts Center. I was there Friday night, and it truly is outstanding. So that's it for my comments. Thank you. Council Member Levinos. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pachowski, for coming to discuss water issues. I uh, appreciate your comments. I appreciate everyone who came today to uh, to listen, to speak, participate in your local government. Um, I, I concur with uh, Council Member um, Litzer's uh, issues, but I just want to clarify that um, I voted uh, to not have new pools. Uh, so I'm not sure what the other city's restrictions are in terms of Santa Clarita or LA. We also are in a unique position as council members here that we're also on the water board. That's not something that's unique to us. Um, that's not the same for Santa Clarita, and it's not the same for the city of LA. So we are council members, and we are water board members. So I just want to point that out. Um, Mr. Rascola, thank you for coming uh, to speak regarding your concerns. I just want to clarify that we are a municip municipality that is, uh, is granted authority by the state of California. The street vendor um, laws, those are, that's a state uh, law that was passed. Um, so we have to make sure that we honor everyone's rights, but make sure that everyone is safe as well. Um, and in terms of uh, Mr. Lapper, thank you for coming to discuss. I did vote in favor. It was a lone vote in favor of having a fireworks ordinance. I want that to be uh, on the record as well as to have a discussion on cannabis and also keeping in mind the other 126,940 residents um, whose opinions matter as well. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, thank you for your comments, and uh, Mr. Pachowski, as we were walking out, I personally was with the city manager, and he became acutely aware of the water was on. 
and uh, that it probably didn't look good. Now, that's asking for government to work in an incredibly fast fashion, to pass an ordinance five minutes earlier and have it off. I didn't, I didn't want to get into an argument with you. I was just trying to tell you that we understand. Okay, and it, it was appreciated. The street vendors, uh, the state changes the laws faster than we can even consider them. And uh, I, I was recently uh, at a shopping center complaining. And when I did the research on it, I found out that as long as they're not on the shopping center property, they're on the sidewalk, they can do whatever they want. And uh, Yeah, there's, no, again, <laughs> we try, but uh, it, it's, it's a battle. Yes. Okay, I got to, I got to stop it. I'm, I'm, I can only say so much, so with that, we'll move on, but thank you for being here tonight. Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council, the next item on the agenda is public hearings. This is a time for testimony on public hearings on the consideration of matters as presented on this agenda. Let the record show that due notice was given as required by law and an affidavit to this effect is on file in the office of the City Clerk. All comments submitted by email have already been provided to the City Council and will be made part of the record. However, they will not be read by the City Clerk this evening. Speakers will be called on in the order in which their card was submitted for this public testimony, item 5, for a period of no more than five minutes each. Persons addressing the City Council are requested to state their name and community of residence. Comments shall be limited to matters relevant to the item on the agenda and may be ruled out of order if comments are unrelated to the item. The reports of the City staff relating to these matters shall be made part of the record of this meeting. If you challenge in court any of the City Council's decisions made here tonight, you may be limited to raising only those issues you or someone else raised at this public hearing. The time within which judicial review must be sought is governed by California Code of Civil Procedures, Section 1094.6. Agenda Item 5A, a public hearing and second reading of Ordinance Number 1337 to consider amendments to the Simi Valley Municipal Code Title VI Animal Regulations and adoption of portions of the County of Ventura's Code of Ordinances related to animal services by reference. The reading of the ordinance is as follows. Ordinance number 1337, introduction of an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Simi Valley repealing Title VI, Chapter 1, Articles 1 through 7 and amending Article 8 of the Simi Valley Municipal Code and adopting the County of Ventura's Code of Ordinances related to animal services by reference, as contained within Division 4, Chapter 4, and Division 2, Chapter 4, Article 6. And Mara Mulch is here to present this item. Good evening, Mayor Mashburn and members of the City Council. At the April 25th City Council meeting, Ordinance number 1337 was introduced amending Title VI of the Simi Valley Municipal Code and adopting portions of the County of Ventura's Code of Ordinances related to animal services by reference. At that time, it was explained that the changes were prompted by county service enhancements and were needed to maintain services to provided, excuse me, provided to the city by the county. This evening is the second reading of Ordinance number 1337 is, and is being held as a public hearing as required by the State Government Code. There have been no changes to the ordinance since its prior presentation to the City Council in April. This concludes staff's report, and I am available if there are any questions. Thank you. Any questions of staff? Okay. Seeing none. Any uh, public statements? None. Okay. At this point, the hearing is closed. Any comments or questions from uh, city council members? Uh, would you like Mayor? Would you like a motion? Sure. 
I was going to get it right. <laughs> I saw that. I didn't want to. I move to adopt ordinance number 1337, amending Title VI of the Simi Valley Municipal Code. Second. second. Motion second. Call for the vote. Motion passes unanimously. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, next item on the agenda is Agenda Item 5B, a public hearing and introduction of an ordinance authorizing the military equipment use policy for the City of Simi Valley Police Department. The reading of the ordinance is as follows. Ordinance number 1342, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Simi Valley, State of California, adding Chapter 45, Military Equipment Policy, to Title V of the City of Simi Valley Municipal Code, governing the use of military equipment by the Police Department. And Commander Richie Liu is here to present this item. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the Council. Uh, tonight, this is the public hearing phase of what uh, we introduced to you the last time uh, that this came about. But before we get started and before I hand it over to Commander Liu, I just wanted to um, clarify the foundation issue. Uh, the Police Foundation provides uh, funds for things that aren't budgeted for, and since all of this is equipment that is part of our regular city budget, it's not provided by the Foundation. So I've looked through each one of these items, and none of it has been funded by the Foundation. So I just wanted to make that clear for transparency purposes before we start out with this. So. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate that, and I'd also like to point out 1C is uh, any declaration of conflict in uh, none of our esteemed council members uh, said they had a conflict, and uh, I've never questioned them before and certainly wouldn't tonight. So thank you. I'll turn it over to Commander Liu. Thank you, Chief. Again, um, my name is Commander Richie Liu. I'm the uh, executive officer and also the military equipment uh, coordinator. Um, tonight I'm going to go ahead and... So um, tonight we're going to go over what Assembly Bill 41 is, uh, AB 41 requirements, and how AB 41 defines military equipment, and what, uh, why the equipment is needed, and the Simi Valley Police Department's equipment inventory. So on September 30th, uh, 2021, Governor Newsom signed Assembly Bill 41 as part of the package of peace officers reform bills. AB 481 addresses the funding, acquisition, and use of items lawmakers deem military equipment. AB 41 went into effect on January 1, 2022, and requires a law enforcement agency to obtain approval of its governing body to enact a military equipment use policy before purchasing, using, raising funds for, or acquiring military equipment. AB 41 requires the policy be submitted to the City Council and posted on the City's website 30 days prior to the public hearing where the policy will be considered and proposed for adoption by ordinance. Furthermore, AB 41 requires similar approval for the continued use of military equipment acquired by the Simi Valley Police Department prior to January 1st of 2022 and allows the government, bod government body to approve the funding, acquisition, use of military equipment within its jurisdiction only if it determines that the military equipment meets specified standards. AB 41 requires each law enforcement agency's government body to commence with an adoption of a written military equipment use policy by ordinance in a public meeting by May 1st of 2022 in order to continue the use of this previously acquired military equipment. The reason AB 41 was enacted was to increase transparency, ensure accountability for the equipment and acquisition of use of the equipment. The equipment provides safeguards to protect the public's welfare, safety, civil rights, and liberties. This bill requires an annual report to summarize the equipment usage, updates, document internal audits, and summarize community feedback. So AB 41 requires law enforcement agencies to begin the approval process from the City Council for adoption of military use policy by ordinance. This policy shall uh, include an inventory list of military equipment. The Simi Valley Police Department Policy 707 is posted on the department's website and has a full and detailed list of all the equipment owned by the Simi Valley Police Department as defined by AB 41. 
Once the ordinance is approved, the Simi Valley Police Department will be required to provide an annual report to City Council on the use, updates, audits, and community feedback for the military equipment and for any new equipment requested for approval from City Council. So the reason we have uh, this equipment designated by AB 41 is to have a safe, peaceful resolution for the all involved, the public and officers to positively influence outcomes by making it safer for the involved parties and surrounding community. We use these tools to decrease risk to civilian deaths and increase the ability to protect civil rights and civil liberties of persons that are subject to arrest but not compliant. To improve physical and psychological well-being by decreasing the likelihood of force applications and improving chances of a safe and peaceful resolution. And finally, we expect this equipment to positively influence outcome by providing safer options for the apprehension of high risk or violent offenders. This equipment also assists us in de-escalating an incident. De-escalation is a process or collection of tactics used to prevent, reduce, and manage behaviors associated with conflict. To handle potential threats of violence, other potential volatile situations in order to mitigate someone's actions, capabilities, and intentions, officers need time, distance, and cover in order to make sound decisions, discuss contingencies, and have a better chance of success. The urgency of any incident revolves around the risk factors for all those involved. Containing actions, mitigating capabilities, and influencing intentions help move us towards our goal of a safe, peaceful resolution for the public, the involved parties, and officers. As law enforcement professionals, we need real, and practical, reasonable options to influence or resolve an event when necessary. Our officers generally do so without having to use this equipment, but when the need arises, we need this equipment. This equipment saves lives and helps with the de escalation. The legislation defines military equipment in 15 categories. I want to demystify the term military equipment. AB 41's definition of military equipment extends beyond the equipment that has a clear default to military use and not just for equipment designated by the Federal Defense Logistics Agency. So by definition, the equipment we have is designated by AB 41 as military equipment. However, the majority of the equipment that the Simi Valley Police Department owns is made specifically for law enforcement and not the military. And some of this equipment is available for commercial purchase by the public. Uh, the Simi Valley Police Department has had this equipment for many, many years and has saved numerous lives. So AB 4081 outlines 15 categories for military equipment, and out of the 15 categories, we have uh, seven out of those uh, categories. I will go through the equipment uh, that the Simi Valley Police Department has in its inventory. So category one, unmanned, remotely piloted, powered aerial or ground vehicles. The department currently owns an iRobot 110 pictured on the right. Uh, the robot is about the size of a remote-controlled hobby vehicle. The robot provides officers the ability to visually inspect hazardous environments. The robot can be utilized during high-risk situations such as a barricaded subject or hostage rescue. The robot may be, be also used to inspect hazardous material and possible explosive devices. The robot is not armed and only has a camera to provide situational awareness from a safe distance. The robot is generally deployed with the SWAT team during critical incidents. And if you see on the bottom uh, right there or center, uh, that photo was an older um, uh, RC car that one of our officers modified, put a tray on it so we can deliver food and items during a hostage situation. So under AB 41, that is considered uh, military equipment, which it clearly is not. So. Category three, high mobility, multi-purpose wheeled vehicles, Humvees, or two and a half ton trucks, five ton trucks, or wheeled vehicles that have a breaching or entry apparatus attached. The department has a Lenco Bearcat pictured there in the center uh, that was purchased through forfeited assets. This is an armored rescue vehicle, or ARV, specifically made for law enforcement. This vehicle is built on a commercially ve uh, commercial vehicle truck chassis, in specific the Ford F550, and has no weapons affixed to it. It does have the capability of attaching a breaching arm in order to safely defeat a fortified location. 
The ARV is used in response to critical incidents to enhance officer and community safety, improve scene containment and stabilization, and assist in resolving critical situations. I, I did equate this vehicle to a bank's armored truck, and before the Lenco ARV, we had a donated armored truck, uh, pictured there on the left. After the bank truck, we obtained the V-150 through the Federal Defense Logistics Agency. Both these vehicles have since be de been decommissioned and no longer used by the Simi Valley Police Department. Like the RC car we previously used, we, util we utilized what we had available at the time to make it safer for everybody. But as technologically developed, police departments across the country were better equipped. The Simi Valley Police Department has used these ARVs in many critical incidents and have saved many lives. Uh, in 1995, we used the armored truck uh, to breach a concrete wall to rescue Officer Michael Clark, who was shot and killed uh, responding to a welfare check. Uh, in 1997, uh, the Simi Valley Police Department responded to a shooting on Hope Street where it was used to rescue victims. In 2009, the Simi Valley Police Department responded to an active shooter at a dental office where it was used to evacuate citizens trapped in nearby businesses. In 2018, the Simi Valley Police Department SWAT team used it to shield uh, and communicate with a teenage juvenile who pointed a firearm at officers and discharged a firearm within the residence. Officers were able to talk the, the subject down, de-escalate the situation, saving the boy's life. These are only the few examples of the many other instances where the ARV was successfully utilized and there is no reasonable alternative that can achieve the same objective as a Lenco Bearcat. So category five, command and control vehicles that are either built or modified to facilitate the operational control and direction of public safety units. The department has two vehicles that fall into this category. The Mobile Command Center, or MCC, which is a Faber Class A commercial recreational vehicle that is outfitted with emergency lights, radios, audiovisual equipment, and whiteboards. The MCC is utilized as a command center during a critical incident or non-critical incidents such as special events, and disaster scenes. The MCC provides mobility, sheltering, logistical support, restroom facilities, and electrical power. The MCC can be used as a backup dispatch center in case of catastrophic failure of our communication center. The other vehicles that fall into this category are our patrol supervisor vehicles. We have three patrol supervisor vehicles, which are Ford Explorers. Uh, these are the exact same black and white patrol vehicles you see out in the streets every day. However, these vehicles fall into this category because the rear cargo area is modified to facilitate the operational control and direction of public safety units. So as you can see, this is an RV, an SUV, and clearly not military equipment. Category seven, battering rams, slugs, and breaching apparatuses that are explosive in nature. The department has a frangible breaching shotgun that is modified with Remington 870 12-gauge shotgun designed to fire a copper or clay compressed project, frangible projectile through a locking mechanism or hinge of a door in order to defeat the hardware. The projectile disintegrates after impact, mitigating the risk of potential injury. The SWAT team utilizes this tool to safely gain entry into the structure or fortified location during critical incidents such as a hostage rescue, high-risk warrants, active shooter incidents, or during accident circumstances where entry is quickly needed and would not be feasible to wait for any other delayed access to the structure. So this is a quick way to defeat locks to enter residences and not intended to be used on a person. So specialized, uh, category 10, specialized firearms and ammunition of less than 50 calibers, including assault weapons as defined in sections 30510 and 30515 of the Penal Code. With the exception of standard issue service weapons and ammunition of less than 50 caliber, they are issued to officers. So the department has two types of firearms that fall into this category and has had these types of firearms for over four decades. The UPR, which is uh, the Urban Patrol Rifle, and the 308 Long Rifle. Both these ri firearms can be purchased by the public and available for commercial purchase. The UPR is a semi-automatic 556 carbine rifle and are used are issued to officers that are specifically trained to operate the, this firearm. The long rifle is a 308 caliber precision rifle and used primarily by our SWAT team. The SWAT team has both the bolt action rifle and a semi-automatic rifle. 
The UPR and long rifles enable officers to address threats at medium to long range with precision or threats that are heavily armed or armored. These precision rifles minimize the risk to officers and innocent members of the public. So according to the FBI, active shooter incidents have increased 100% since 2016 across the nation. But let's talk closer to home. Our officers have responded to the borderline active shooter call and deployed these rifles and were able to rescue victims hiding in the attic. In 2013, an armed suspect shot and killed his mother, set the residence on fire. As officers arrived to investigate and possibly rescue anybody in, still inside the residence, the suspect had hid in a nearby hillside and fired upon responding officers. The suspect later uh, fled on a tractor and shot at residents in the neighborhood. An officer armed with a rifle listed on this equipment list was able to make a precision shot and stop the suspect's shooting spree. Let's, let's, let's get more recent. Just three weeks ago, we had an armed and dangerous murder suspect in our city that fired on our officers. A rifle was used to stop the suspect's actions that endangered the community and the officers' lives, to say the least. These rifles have saved lives and is necessary, and there is no reasonable alternative that can achieve the same objective for community safety. Category seven, uh, 12, flashbang, explosive breaching tools, tear gas, pepper balls, excluding standard service issued handheld pepper spray. The light sound diversionary device or the flashbang is a diversionary device used primarily by our SWAT team during high risk search warrants, arrests, of armed and violent suspects enduring hostage rescues. An intense bright light and loud noise are created to distort, disorient and divert the suspect's attention and give officers time to gain safer access, time to assess and analyze the existing threat. Util utilizing light and sound diversionary device is a way to prevent injury to officers, the public, and involved parties and can often lead to a safer resolution and allow officers to take a suspect without force. The Simi Valley Police Department does not have any explosive breaching tools. As far as tear gas, tear gas is a less lethal method to address violent riots or safely extract a suspect from a fortified or barricaded location or safely detain a suspect who possesses a risk of violence to the community. Tear gas allows officers to deploy less lethal chemical agent into a structure where other weapons would not be capable to and all other means to have that person exit is exhausted. Tear gas affords officers with an added option to avoid le lethal force. When tear gas is necessary for use, there is no reasonable alternative that can achieve the same objective. Tear gas is only used by our SWAT team and those officers are the only speci specially trained personnel to utilize this device. The SWAT team has used tear gas during SWAT incidents and have safely extracted violent, possibly armed suspects from fixed locations. Tear gas can be used uh, for riots after a dispersal order is provided and notifying the crowd of an unlawful assembly. The Simulac Police Department has had several types of tear gas from devices that are deployed by hand and devices that are deployed by either a 40 mil millimeter launching cup that is attached to a shotgun or a launcher specifically for the chemical munition. Pepper ball. Pepper ball launchers uses high pressure air to deliver a ball filled with pepper powder. This is similar and is actually a pepper ball platform in every way except it uses a pepper ball uh, uh, instead of a paintball. The pepper ball is a less lethal option that delivers a pepper powder that is very unpleasant. The pepper ball system allows officers to safely address a violent or armed suspect at a safe distance without having to utilize higher level of force. Again, creating distance provides that, that time that mitigates the suspect's actions and provides for strategies for de-escalation. Category 14, the following projectile launch platforms and their associated munitions. 40 millimeter projectile launchers, beanbag, rubber bullet. The Simi Valley Police Department does not have beanbag or rubber bullets. The department does have two types of projectile launchers a 40 millimeter and a 37 millimeter launcher with their associated impact munitions. The projectile launchers are not firearms and are less lethal launching systems that uses smokeless powder to deliver a 40 millimeter or 37 millimeter kinetic energy projectile from a safe distance. 
This allows officers to address a threat from a greater distance, providing an alternative for deadly force. When reasonable, the less lethal projectile is made of, of foam or rubber material and intended to subdue a violent, uncooperative suspect. The, sus the Simi Valley Police Department utilized this equipment numerous times to safely apprehend a violent suspect and has had been used several times to subdue an armed suspect with a knife. Without this equipment, the only option for our officers would have been lethal force. Therefore, there is no reasonable alternative that can achieve this objective. If we didn't have this equipment, we would have to use lethal force and we would have no option and that's not what we want to have. So AB 40, 481 codified in Government Code 7071 dictates that the government body, in, the, in this case the City Council, shall only approve military equipment use policy if it determines the following. The military equipment is necessary because there is no alternative that can achieve the same objective of officer and civilian safety. Again, this equipment is not military, made specifically for law enforcement, and used by a majority of law enforcement across the, the nation, if not all. The proposed military equipment use policy will safeguard the, the public's welfare, safety, civil rights, and civil liberties. I've cited numerous examples of how this equipment has protected our community for decades. If purchasing the equipment, the equipment is reasonably cost-effective compared to the available alternatives that can achieve the same ob objective. So this does not apply because we're not uh, requesting to purchase any new equipment. But the majority of the equipment uh, I have mentioned were either donated, purchased through a grant, or forfeited assets. Uh, prior military equipment use complied with the military equipment use policy that was in effect at the time. So, and that's why we're here to propose the ordinance to adopt military equipment use policy. So in conclusion, uh, we've used uh, this equipment I mentioned above for years, for over four decades, and the utilization of this equipment has saved countless of lives in our community. I want to thank you and your for your attention and uh, would like to turn it back to the chief. Okay, at this time, uh, council members, do you have any questions of staff? Uh, council member Luevanos. Thank you, Mayor. I have several questions. Um, I know that, um, police chief, you have mentioned the goal of community policing, and that is the philosophy of our police department. Is that correct? That's correct. So how does the use and, uh, of this military equipment align with the goal of community policing in the city of Simi Valley? Because I've had several residents that have said, how can, why do you need military equipment if you have community policing? Can you answer that question for the residents, please? Sure. I mean, it's two different things. First of all, it's not equipment that, it, you know, like uh, Commander Lou just said, it's not equipment you would take to war. It's basically made uh, for civilian purposes. Um, second of all, uh, we have to have tools that we can use that don't threaten people's lives that actually give us options. And so the two things are, are separate. Number one, you know, community policing is really kind of the um, attitude of the police department and it's the approach that we take with the community. And 99% of the time, we have a good interaction with the community, but there are those times when you're confronted with somebody who's violent and having a bad day. And, you know, we wanna have tools available that we can, you know, perhaps save that person's life. I'll give you a good example. 1996, I went on a domestic violence call and I was attacked by an individual who was under the influence of methamphetamine with a section, about a four foot section of half inch rebar. And uh, had the sergeant not been there with um, the uh, projectile launcher, I would have had to shoot that individual. Uh, we ended up shooting him with a plastic bullet. He dropped the rebar and was taken into custody. And, you know, I think up until two years ago, that guy would write me letters all the time because of the fact that you know, under the circumstances, uh, he was having a really bad day. And so we had the tools to prevent, um, you know, me having to actually use deadly force. So that was something intimately that I experienced. But again, like I would say, the two things are separate. Com community policing means that you are responsive to the community, that you're transparent with the community. And part of what we're here for right now in, in displaying the equipment is, yes, in compliance with the law but also as part of our, our transparency with the community. So I think the two go together. I mean, we don't have anything here that, you know, um, you, like I said, you wouldn't take this equipment to war. It's not um, designed uh, for those purposes. It's designed for the purpose of, you know, like Commander Lou reiterated, for 
giving us um, a wide range of tools for any kind of a circumstance. Um, if you just look at what happened, the tragedy in, in, in Buffalo, um, here was a retired police officer who confronted a, a suspect that had body armor and a helmet, a Kevlar helmet. And here's a trained police officer who tried to stop him and was murdered by this individual who took several shots and was able to defeat it with body armor and equipment that he was able to purchase. So I, I, I can't send my officers out into the field without the tools that they can use to not only defend themselves, but also to defend the public. So that's how I would say you have to really look at community policing different. Now, if I think, you know, where I think you're going with it and when you're talking about the residents' perspectives, yes, does this stuff look intimidating? And, you know, does it, does it seem like, wow, you know, the police department has this military equipment and why should they have it if they really are community-based? Well, you know, like I said, I don't want to have to use it, and 99% of the time we don't have to use it. In fact, I can tell you, I mean, being with the police department for 34 years and working my way through every rank and serving on all these different details, I can probably tell you, um, you know, less than 10 times have we ever used tear gas. Um, we talked about tear gas and riot control. We've never used tear gas and riot control. We've never had a riot here in Simi Valley. So, um, you know, again, these are things that, you know, um, I really believe in preparation. Uh, you know, um, it's, I was a Boy Scout. The motto of the Boy Scouts is be prepared. You know, you never want to have to use first aid or use CPR, but you train to do it. And so that's how I would really kind of address that question. Okay. Um, my next question is, has any of this equipment not been used? Uh, both you and Officer Lou have said you've had some of this stuff for over 40 years. So uh, one of the requirements, according to the law, is that um, it needs to be, um, you know, something that you would use or would need to use. Um, so according to the first two, uh, that there's no reasonable alternative and that um, it will demonstrate the... The, its use will demonstrate the sa and safeguard the public's welfare, safety, civil rights, and civil liberties. So is there stuff that we, and you mentioned the last time, mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff that we've had for a long time. Right. Is there stuff that we haven't used that we can get rid of? I would say um, there, there is, the first part of the question, yes, there is stuff that we haven't used, but there, there isn't anything on there that I think we can get rid of because they're all, you know, again, we've purchased this and, and um, trained with this for specific tasks. So... For instance, if you'd say, well, we, we don't need the uh, marks, the marksmen don't need a rifle with a scope on it, right? Because we've never used it, uh, thankfully. But uh, the fact of the matter is, is that we might have a situation, uh, you know, strange things happen sometimes. Like he had discussed, a, a guy got on a tractor and was, was shooting, you know? So we didn't have to use a scoped rifle in that kind of a situation. But nevertheless, um, there might be a case where you have somebody holding a hostage with a, with a weapon and you want to have that precision shot. So... Yes, we've never used the long rifle, but I, I wouldn't want to not have it because there's an, app, you know, an applicability to it. Um, and out of the other things on there, I mean, you saw the, the, the robot. Um, you know, what he didn't mention, you know, the, the, the chassis of the remote control car under there was made by one of the officer's sons in, in, in his shop class at Simi High School because they needed an, uh, something that they could fulfill that task with. So I don't really see anything on there. Um, you know, we don't, like I said, we don't have anything explosive. We don't have, we don't have tracked vehicles. Um, you know, uh, if, you, if you really look at uh, police equipment these days um, and, and, you know, and understanding um, what is meant by the militarization of the police, if you've, if you've read that book, The Rise of the Warrior Cop, um, that talks about this and talks about the police industrial complex. Um, really, that was designed in, in the nature of um, this relationship between the Department of Defense and police departments. We don't have that kind of a relationship. We don't have a Department of Defense that is supplying us with used military equipment that is overly militarizing our police department. So what we're using are things that are, again, they're commercially available, um, that we do a lot of research before we buy anything like this, um, and really um, they fit with trends that are happening in, in other places. Um, I also think militarization is a mindset. And going back to your point on community policing, you know, our officers, we're not at war with our community. You know, we're not an occupying army. Um, and, you know, uh, as you know, I've, you know, I'm actually writing a book right now about police militarization. And, you know, that's not the, that's not the mindset we have here. It's, it's two different things. It's not just equipment. It's what you do with the equipment. And it's the way that you train the officers. And so we emphasize community policing. We emphasize, um, you know, um, uh, you know uh, implicit bias training and things like that. 
um, because we don't want to be looked at as an occupying army. Um, if you look at the history of this department, uh, we started in, in Sorry, 1971. Chief. I don't want you to get too far astray from okay. the main issue here. I, I have a follow-up question to that. I, you mentioned, you know, if, if we should need it, but you have mentioned in the past that there is reciprocity. Um, that was one of the justifications you used for needing this military surplus mm -hmm. equipment was that we are at, uh, our police department is asked to help other police departments. Um, or, and I'm assuming the sheriff's department as well. So right. if we needed that equipment, couldn't we call on those other police departments to bring that in so that we wouldn't have to have it? Doesn't the re does the reciprocity go both ways? Yes, so, so uh, you, we, we could definitely call them, but it would take a lot longer, obviously, right? They're, they're usually coming from a different city, different county. When we need something, it's gonna be very uh, quick, unexpected, and we need it. I would equate this that, you know, to, to the, the, the fire extinguishers that we have in this building. We've never used those, but we have it here just in case uh, um, uh, we need it. And that's why I think we have the, uh, that's why we have this equipment, is to make sure that you know, we safeguard the community the best we can. And that's what, that's what they pay me to do. And I wanna make sure that I have all my avenues covered for this, and that's why we get this, this equipment. And in terms of reciprocity, I mean, it's a good point. I mean, we don't have a bomb squad you know, we, we rely on the sheriff's department for that. Those, those are things that, you know, um, there's usually an element of time involved in that, but we can't really rely on the sheriff's department for a patrol rifle, which is gonna be needed at the, at the scene at the time, so. Okay, thank you for answering that question. Um, I, I do have more questions, but I, I know that Mayor Pro Tem has questions too, so if I can ask more questions later, Mayor, I would greatly appreciate it. Now go ahead and do your questions, unless. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes. My other question is, has anyone ever died from using any of these uh, military equipment? In terms of? That we own, that our police department owns. Has anyone ever died from use of that, from the pepper balls, from the, you know, uh, from the rifle, from, you know, the use that we don't have tear, we, we, ha we do have tear gas, right? Mm -hmm. And flashbangs yes, and pepper balls, and even though those are non-lethal, has anyone ever died or gotten seriously injured from use of this? Uh, no, they have not. In fact, I don't believe we've ever even used the pepper ball gun. We have it, but we've, I don't believe we've ever shot it at anybody, that I, to my knowledge. Um, but no, we have never had a fatality in, in regards to that. Not, not here, just in general, like any police department that has used that. Has there, there ever been a fatality? I, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, I don't have an answer for that. You know. Okay, and, and I'm asking because I know for a fact, I, I know you know that I'm a criminal justice major and I have a law degree, so... I too read those books, and yes, I have read that book. Um, that you know, there there have been fatalities from use of the pepper balls, when, when especially all all of the things that you mentioned, Officer Lou, was that these are meant to be used long range, and when they're used at a short range, that's when you have uh, lethality. That's when you have uh, people dying because they're intended to be long distance. They're not intended to be used at a short distance. So, and, and that's a that's a training issue. And and as you just saw over 2020, there were even you know um, less lethal. And sometimes, if it's not used properly, and you're not uh, if you're not properly trained to use it, if it if it hits somebody in an area that you're not supposed to hit them in, it can cause injuries. Absolutely. And the the other comment that you made was that um, you know the the incident that just happened in Buffalo, New York, where the the perpetrator had body armor, uh, and I had asked this question previously, so I would appreciate an answer. Um, is that something that we should have or that we could have in lieu of having tanks, in lieu of having armored vehicles that are perceived by the public as tanks? Um, because if it was, you know, if it protected the shooter, wouldn't that protect our officers? In terms of um, the type of equipment that the shooter? Instead, yes, instead of having, because several times you both mentioned that this is, this is equipment that civilians can have access to. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm assuming, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that you're saying that you would like the same level of protection. And you know, if it's a choice between, part of the requirement is that you know, are, there's no other alternative methods of use. So if we're concerned about protecting our officers, then why can't we use body armor instead of using uh, a bearcat? Instead of using, you know, you know, why can't we use bulletproof shields or body armor to protect our officers that are going into those situations instead of an armored vehicle? I mean, it's a good question. We we do use that we do use that material. We do you know our SWAT officers have. I mean that person in Buffalo was equipped like a SWAT officer basically. So we do have that. Our officers do have body armor. But there are times when uh, you know the Bearcat you know is used uh, that 
wouldn't really apply. We wouldn't put an officer out front in body armor because they're more vulnerable. Um, whereas if we take the Bearcat in situations that we have used it, we can drive right up and because it's, it's armored, we can have a conversation with somebody. Um, I, know, I know when we first got it, um, this was under Chief McCann, uh, we actually, the first time we used it was there was a suicidal subject in a car. So we were able to drive up and have a conversation with that person through the window without having a threat to the officer. You'd never want an officer, even with body armor, to go up and, and address that because it would make them more vulnerable. So I would say that um, you know, it's, it's about accountability, it's about supervision and management, and you know, the Bearcat isn't something that gets used on an everyday basis. So, but the body armor is something the officers always have. So yeah, definitely um, we, you know, we would use it for different uh, applications. And, and, something, and something where the Bearcat uh, has helped us was during uh, uh, critical incidents, we've actually evacuated uh, the community with this vehicle. So we actually piled uh, uh, citizens in this vehicle to move them out of a danger area uh, on, on, with cover. So we wouldn't be able to feasibly do that with, with vests or helmets, uh, and we especially have a large amount of, uh, how many, of I'm sorry. How many armored vehicles do we have? We have three? We have one. We have one. Okay, because the picture you well, showed. The, the picture was pretty ones. much, yeah, I know that was probably a little confusing. The picture was just to show you the progression of where we've come. We had the, the Brinks truck, um, and then we had the V-150. And, and so as newer technology came available, we were able to get and do away with the other ones that we had. So that really is maybe deceiving. It shows you the progression of where we've come. So can I ask a, another question? If the Bearcat is meant, intended to save lives and to protect our officers and protect our residents that need to be evacuated from dangerous situations, is it, uh, and I, I'm assuming that's to, uh, you know, demonstrate to, you know, whoever the perpetrator or the person you know, with a weapon or a gun or, you know, whoever's dangerous, that you know that you can't get past this. Is it really appropriate to be using that vehicle to deliver toys? Is that really going to instill a sense of respect for that vehicle if we're using it to deliver toys to kids? I mean, it, number one, it's not used to intimidate. It's basically um, used uh, to it's as, as a safety measure, right? It's to protect the people inside of it. So it's not, you know, a tank would be used to intimidate. So it's basically it's used like as a rescue vehicle. So. Um, no, to answer your first question, that, that wouldn't be the case. The second thing is, again, when we're talking about community policing, and you and I, have, we've, we've debated this three times now, and, and I mean, you know, um, I, I think we can agree to disagree. I just think that um, it's one of those things that humanizes the police officers that people can see, you know, that, hey, we're humans too. Uh, you know, we're not all robotic, and, and you know, uh, kids like trucks. And they like to see things. I mean, you know, like I said, I've been a police officer for 34 years, and I've gone into lots of schools to talk to, to kids. And as much as I don't like it, the first thing the kids hone in on is they look at your weapon and they see it. But part of the idea of community policing is that you um, can get on their level and you can interact with them outside of the context of what we do normally. So, so we'll agree to disagree on that. I think it's a great thing. Um, you know, it, it, the public loves it. Um, you know, I certainly, if I had complaints about it, I would certainly look into those and take those seriously. But it's, you know, it's something that you and I think will just agree to d disagree with on that. Okay, that just seems contradictory. And then I, I just have one more question, and this is for uh, Officer Lou. You stated, I, and I counted four times, that, you know, this is clearly not military equipment. Um, and I understand that you probably disagree with this law based on your comments. Um, you know, I, that, again, we are a municipality that was granted authority by the state of California, as is every other municipality in the state of California. Um, so whether or not you agree with what the legislators have deemed as military equipment or not, that, that's the law, that, you know, that we, we have to comply with that because, um, you know, th that's what re the residents of the state of California have asked their legislators, you know, elected officials like ourselves to do, to make sure there's transparency and accountability. Um, so I just have one more question. Um, can you tell me how much the quantity of each item that we have? What was that question again? How much of each item do we have? How many flashbangs and tear gas and pepper balls and how many shotguns do we have? Is, is, hold on just one second. I'd like to have the city attorney. Oh, we talk I, there's things that we don't agree with with the state. It makes, it, it doesn't mean we're gonna break laws. I don't agree with giving our inventory. But if the state says we have to give our inventory, then so be it. 
Apparently, apparently that's what the state requires. I was a little surprised by that myself. I think public public okay. safety, officer safety should be paramount, but the legislature has deemed that itemized lists can be public information in this instance. Is that correct, Commander Luke? Yes, that is correct. Hey, so, thank you. Thank so, you. So for the for the first question, uh, council member, um, yeah, absolutely. That, that's why we're here. We're apply, we're complying with the legislation and, and all that stuff. When I do when I do uh, refer to some of the equipment that I had shown as not military equipment, I would, that, I'm that, sorry to interrupt. I just want to make sure you don't have to give your personal opinion whether or not you agree. Oh, or disagree. Um, okay. Yeah, and and what I'm saying is that that truly isn't military equipment. Uh, uh, I know what military equipment is. I've been in the military. The, the, the stuff that we have that, that I showed you is not military equipment. Um, as for the second part of it, yes, absolutely. It's it's detailed in a staff report. If, but if you want me to, I can uh, go through each item. But it's detailed in a staff report. It's also in our website, our full inventory, and it has all that stuff. But if you want, I can go through each and every one of them. Yeah, I I I would for for the public for them to have it so that it's on the record. I know it's in the staff report, but. I don't think that's necessary, in my opinion. It's on the website I think also. It's on the website. It's, it was in the report, the last report you had, and it's in the report today. I, I don't think it's, we need to itemize and go through it at this I think point. It's fine to direct our public to the website. Well, we do on every subject. Can, can you at least let us know how many of Category 10 you have? Given, given all the shootings that we've had in the past three days, uh, that is uh, a concern of many residents. Could, could I confirm all the shooting we've had in the last? You're talking the United States of I'm America. I'm talking about in general, in including two here country. in Southern California this past weekend. Okay, but I just want to confirm that we're not talking about a bunch of shootings in Simi Valley. No, I, I stated Southern California, Mayor. So, so can, can I just get that one, Category 10? So in specific, Category 10 has the UPR uh, rifles, so we have uh, 120 in our inventory for that. And how many sworn officers do we have? Budget of 123. How many do we have currently? We have approximately 100, 106, 107 right now. We're hiring more, so we're taking applications. <laughs> okay, do you, do you feel we need all 120 UPRs to preserve life and keep civilian civil rights safe? I, I don't think that's an appropriate question. I'm sorry, and I apologize. The standard that's actually part of the state standard. It states here. Uh, it, if you look if you like at the standard, it says on report page three um, that um, you need to demonstrate that the military equipment is necessary because there is no reasonable alternative that can achieve the same objective of officer and civilian safety. And it also says that you, the department has a burden of proving, of demonstrating that the proposed military equipment use will safeguard the public's welfare, safety, civil rights and civil liberties. So I want to make sure that we're compliant with state law. I think your question was more specific, and I think um, the law requires that you provide whether or not there's a reasonable alternative. So the question could be posed that way. Also, the question is whether or not this equipment will safeguard not only the public, well, the policy will safeguard the public's welfare, safety, and civil rights and civil liberties. Those are general questions, and I think your question just was a little bit more specific. And I'm just trying to protect the city's interests I'm, I'm just curious as to, because most of these weapons you said that the SWAT team uses, do we have 120 SWAT members? No, we do not have 120 SWAT members, but uh, the urban patrol rifles are uh, for patrol officers, not for SWAT members. I mean, SWAT members do use them, but uh, they're also for the officers that are trained. So we have several officers throughout the organization who are trained to use them. We also have that number because uh, they need maintenance and we need to have them available you know, so it's, you know, it's, it's there so that if we wanted to outfit everybody in the department with one, if they got the training, we, would, we could do it. How many SWAT officers do we have? Currently, we have 16. 16, one six? Yes. Okay. I, and, and again, I'm asking, and I, I too have, I studied criminal justice in Washington, D.C. I literally spoke to the director of the Department of Defense Budget Department, and where they, you know, got an extra $3 billion and spent it in, the, in half an hour. And when I asked them, what were you spending this extra $3 billion on, they said equipment that they then would turn around and let local law enforcement agencies use. Um, so I know that even though it's been modified, that's why it's defined as military equipment. Even though it's been modified for use for law enforcement officers, it was initially created 
for the Department of Defense for military use. Well, like you said, it's the law. It's the state law. We comply with the state law. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't think that's even that's not even an issue. I just know that we aren't in any relationship with the Department of Defense or purchasing anything through any cooperative, you know, uh, purchases or anything like that. So how did we get the Bearcat? Was that not military surplus? No, the Bearcat is not military surplus. It was designed for civilian law enforcement, and it was prior to me being chief, but it was purchased with forfeited assets. Okay, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Litzner. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the detail of the report this time and last time, and I have to admit, as you're giving it, I'm thinking this is a real burden to require the police to identify munitions and equipment in such detail, and then require detailed justification, and then for the report when it's actually used, and I understand that's all required annually, but I recognize this is tremendous transparency, um, but a burden. So thank you for fulfilling that um, responsibility. But my question is, um, the term military equipment, we've been talking about that all night. What is the difference between military equipment and police equipment? I'm identifying what the military equipment that AB 41 defines as military equipment. So what so you're saying is that we don't even have a definition of police equipment per se. We have what this, the legislature has said is military equipment, and then anything else that the police department uses then by default is understood to well, be police equipment. One, one, one thing that you can, you can see the difference in is that, for instance, the patrol rifles we have, um, they're semi-automatic rifles. Uh, military rifles usually have a three-round burst or they have fully automatic uh, capability. We don't have anything like that. I understand that. So I guess that, that was why I'm trying to understand what the definition. I, I think a, lot of our, a lot of our equipment is for, for defense. I mean, right, if, right. if you look at military equipment, it's very offensive. Offensive, yes. You know, all their equipment, all their vehicles, all that stuff have, are armed or, or have weapon systems. We, could, we don't have that. Could I ask that in a layman's term? Do very many wars take place where the soldiers take non-lethal weapons and go fight the enemy. Isn't that what the difference is? Like I said, I, you know, um, my basic response to that would be is that n none of what we have is anything that you would take into a, a war. It's not offensive. Um, it's, it's not, you know, uh, the, the difference, you know, military uh, is supposed to go annihilate the enemy, right? And the police department is there to protect and serve and save lives. It's a and they're that, fundamentally philosophical different approaches. That's the, the point of my question is, or my statement, because I think that in itself is what makes uh, military is different than, because you guys have a whole bunch of stuff that is non-lethal. So the, it, the main issue, the main issue with the whole concept of militarization, and, and I'll, I'll stop, Mr. City Attorney, because I, you know, I don't want to go into a history <laughs> dissertation. But the the main the main issue is um, again that, uh, as with anything, is that uh, certain things were abused and taken to the extremes. And I think that's the the big the big difference here is what we're, we're what we're using is things that are, that are tools that we've had for a long time. But what's happened in some other agencies, you know, throughout the country is they've overly you know, grabbed whatever they can, MRAPs, tracked vehicles, things like that. And that's, I think that's w what the law's intent is here, is to prevent that from happening. Um, and so what, we, what we're doing is being transparent, complying with it. Um, we would never get anything like that, uh, you know. Uh, and so I think that's, that's what it's set up. It's set up for that time that you have somebody that goes too far. Mayor Pro Tem, in response to your question, though, as Commander Liu indicated, it's it's delineated in the government code, government code section 7070, and it identifies what is military equipment. And, I, and I understand that. And I guess what it bothers me is that what I don't, don't see delineated is what is then police equipment, what is not military, because is because I, you've made, an, in my mind, an excellent case of all of how this actually is very useful, very helpful, and can save lives and actually minimize conflict and, and loss of life. And so that's what I'm trying to understand if the state provided also that this is military equipment we think you should have, and I'm, I I'm gather that's not part of the bill. Um, one just quick question, actually, for Council Member Luevenos, if I might, who has um, obviously had some concerns. What one item would you take, would you have our police get rid of? 
one out of all of all yes. of, the of that whole list what do you find the most offensive which one item would you think is not helpful to our police you know i i well that's a difficult question to ask um i i, I think the way in which the bearcat is being used is so you would re you would remove the bearcat i would say the way in which it is being used is inappropriate and the and as i understand the bearcat was used recently with a su so that someone could get up close to talk to a suicide victim who had a gun and so that Suicide victim was saved. Didn't I mean there was no shooting that occurred? Is that the, probably the most recent use? Did, is that was indicated last time? Yeah. Yeah. So our, our SWAT team uh, had responded to, like I said before, had responded to a juvenile teenager mm -hmm. that actually pointed a weapon at all our officers, and and uh, absolutely, if somebody's pointing a weapon at you, you have to defend yourself. But because they had the Bearcat, they were able to use that as a shield. And, and, and be behind that vehicle, they actually were able to approach the, the juvenile and actually talk him into putting the weapon down and, and giving up, you know. So these, these tools help us to de-escalate that situation because if we didn't have that Bearcat and he's shooting and he, there, we have no other option. So, no, thank you. That, that, that's it for my questions. I appreciate it. Council Member Kavanaugh. I, I won't take too long. I just want to thank Commander Lou and Chief Livingstone for all of your uh, dedication and hard work on this report and explaining it to everybody so everyone understands. And I will reiterate what I said the last time is we as a community need to ensure that our police department has the tools that they need to keep themselves safe, to keep us safe. So thank you both. Okay, at this time, is there anybody in the council chambers, public, wish to speak? Mr. Mayor, we do have one speaker, Mr. Okay. Joe Pachowski. Good evening, Mayor Mashburn, members of the city council. <clears throat> I'm, I wanted to speak tonight, first and foremost, because... No sooner did Chief Livingstone and Commander Liu appear before the council recently than we had a situation where a, uh, a wanted individual from Los Angeles County came over into our city and was threatening harm to both our officers and our citizens. And frankly, thankfully, they were able to keep it from escalating any further to the point where they had to pull out any of this equipment. I'm grateful for that. They did an excellent job with that, and they deserve our thanks. At the same time, this whole debate over military equipment boils down to one thing. The liberal Democrats in Sacramento have decided to label things as military equipment simply because it's black and scary. That's the bottom line. Because as the, as, the, as the officers in front of you have pointed out tonight, this is all not military equipment. And so it's simply what the legislature has chosen to de define it as and not what it actually is. And so while I appreciate the fact that we're complying with the law, the law in, it, in, in, in and of itself is ridiculous. Thank you. Thank you. Is that the only speaker? Okay. You want to respond to anything, staff? My only response is basically just, you know, the law is there because, um, uh, you know, the transparency part of it. Uh, I think um, regardless of, you know, what people feel is or is not military equipment, we can debate that seven ways to Sunday. Bottom line is we're accountable to the people and what we use uh, we should be transparent with. That's what I feel about it. And, you know, um, I think, I think uh, uh, in the past, like I said, things have been abused. And when they get abused, um, you know, sometimes laws come out uh, and, and, you know, try to change things around. But the bottom line is, is that um, it is the law. We'll comply with it and um, we'll continue to be transparent with the community about anything that we have. 
Okay, thank you. Um, are you on there because you have another question, Ruth? I, I just would like the opportunity to make a comment before we vote, Mayor. That, that comes soon, okay. Uh, this time the hearing is closed, and uh, so we'll take any questions from the members of the council. Questions or comments, Mayor? Both. I, I would like to make a comment, but I'd like to give some, uh, another council member the opportunity to speak, if they so wish. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm going to vote no on this. Um, section, um, subsection D1 of GS Section 7071 requires all four requirements to be met. They have, two of those requirements have not been met. Uh, we have failed to demonstrate that the military equipment is necessary because there is no reasonable alternative that can achieve the same objective of officer and civilian safety. Uh, there was also no demonstration that the proposed military equipment use will safeguard the public's welfare, safety, civil rights, and civil liberties. There have been, in fact, 67 deaths due to the use of pepper balls alone. I'm not going to even go into the other statistics in the state of California. So I know that those um, have impacted um, because, and maybe it is lack of training, maybe they didn't know that those were supposed to be used long distance. Uh, since, you know, I don't, I'm not privy to the, the training that our officers have. I wouldn't know whether or not they're properly trained. I know we're hiring new officers. I don't know what training they get before they come to us or once they get to us, so I don't know if they're aware of that or not. We also have reciprocity, as you stated, Chief, uh, with, other, uh, with the Sheriff's Department and other local law enforcement agencies. So if there was need of that equipment, I know that they would answer the call just as we have answered the call for them. So for that reason, I will be voting no on this ordinance. And Mayor, if I might make a quick, quick statement then as well. Okay. I, I would like to go on the record that I think that Commander Liu and our, our Chief of Police has demonstrated very clearly that the military equipment that we currently own is necessary because there is no reasonable alternative that can achieve the same objectives. And I think that point was made very clearly. And secondly, I believe that they have demonstrated the proposed military equipment use policy will safeguard, and I will say has safeguarded, the public's welfare, safety, civil rights, and civil liberties. So I want to be very clear that I completely agree with the previous statement that was just made. And um, I believe that the case was made very clearly that we were being very careful about the use of our equipment, very, very transparent, very, um, very, uh, and that anything that was mentioned as far as a potential um, harm has not occurred in Simi Valley and should not be in any way associated with our, with our police force. So thank you. Thank you. Oh. Mr. Mayor, if I could, I'd like to make a motion. Yes. Move to introduce ordinance number 1342, authorizing a military equipment use policy for the police department. Second. Does it require a second or a vote? Okay, thank you. It gets good, though. Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council, next on the agenda is item 7, the consent calendar. And there are six resolutions for your consideration this evening. Consent to item seven, resolution number 2022-22. A resolution of the City Council of the City of Simi Valley pursuant to the provisions of the Landscaping and Lighting Act of 1972, evidencing the Council's intention to levy assessments for the 2022-23 fiscal year on those lots within Simi Valley Landscape District number one describing the proposed improvements and ordering the engineer to prepare and file a report. Resolution number 2022-23, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Simi Valley approving the engineer's report for Simi Valley Landscape District number one. And resolution number 2022-24, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Simi Valley declaring its intention pursuant to the Landscaping and Lighting Act of 1972 to levy and collect assessments on those lots or parcels within Simi Valley Landscape District Number 1, describing the improvements and their location and fixing a time and place for and giving notice of a public hearing by the City Council on the question of the levy of proposed assessments for the fiscal year 2022-23. Consent to Item 8. Resolution number 2022-25, a 
a resolution of the City Council of the City of Simi Valley approving the City of Simi Valley Local Road Safety Plan. Consent Item 9, Resolution Number 2022-26, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Simi Valley implementing a schedule of sanitation rates and fees and authorizing the County of Ventura to collect residential sanitation service rates on the tax roll for physical year 2022-23. And finally, consent to item number 10, resolution number WWD 287, a resolution of the Board of Directors of Ventura County Waterworks District number eight, establishing a water service standby charge for physical year 2022-23. Okay, ready for consent items? Anybody want anything pulled? Mayor, I'd like to pull consent items two, three, seven, eight, and 10. Okay. Um, Elaine, let's start. So may I move that we approve items one, four, five, six, did you say 10? Yes, yes I said, said 10. 10. Okay, I'm sorry, okay. And nine. nine right, and I got the X. So one, four, five, six at this point. And nine. And nine. And nine. Second. Okay. Call for the vote. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Luevanos, questions on number two. Thank you, Mayor. I, I had a question, I, and I don't know if anyone's here from the free clinic or who can answer those questions. We can answer it. Okay. Um, I saw in the, um, and this is for the community, um, that the, and, and part of the reason that we funded it, that we gave the, the um, community uh, grant fund for the free clinic was that it was to be, the space was to be used by uh, a number of community agencies and nonprofits. I saw in the report that 82% of the space is occupied, uh, but the nonprofits that would like space, I, I'm assuming for the 18% that's left, have to contribute to overhead costs and insurance. Does that align with the goals and the requirements of the grant? Yes. So they, they can be required to provide that? The, the, free clinic, the free clinic can ask participants in that to pay for their portion of that share, uh, that cost, yes. Okay. And it's my understanding that the current ones do as well already. Okay. Correct. And if, if someone would like to use that space, like not rent a space, not be there permanently, but just use the room, you know, if they're a nonprofit or a community organization, hey, we want to have a meeting there once a month, just like our library is available for, our library community room is available for community use, is that room available for, you know, like, hey, we want to have a one-hour meeting once a month. That's strictly up to the free clinic. Okay, so there's nothing, and I'm asking because I want to make sure that we're in compliance with the develop the community grant fund requirements. They are in compliance. Okay, so they can require, if someone wants to use it, they can require that they have to pay a certain cost. They certainly could if they choose to. Okay, and that's not a violation of the grant. Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, question. Can I May I just confirm on number two? When, what we're voting on, too, is, is, is approving um, the, the, the grant usage and also the movement of the 10000 from the contingency. The funds. release of it. The yeah. release of that. I just want to be sure that is part of the motion, correct? That's, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, number three, Council Member Levinos. Yes, I, I'm curious as to why we are piggybacking on Morgan Hill's agreement. Uh, did we not do an RFP? Well, they already did the RFP, so they've done the work for us. So they have gone through the process to do an RFP. So we are uh, utilizing their, the work that they ho have already done in order to achieve that. They got very favorable pricing, which is actually their only, our contract that we would be, we are recommending would only be $19,000 over what we're currently paying for a three year period. And that really is only to cover postage cost. So it is a it is a good use of our staff time to be able to piggyback onto existing contracts. Is is Morgan Hill as a city similar to Simi Valley and 
demographics and income and they're, usage they're paying of on these a services? per piece basis. It, it's a per piece basis, not a uh, overall contract. Okay, so I, I just wanted to make sure I, you know, I, I treasure the RFP process because of the transparency and accountability, and also making sure that our taxpayers know that they're getting the best value for the money that they're paying. Yes. So that's why is this common that that we do this that we piggyback on other cities' agreements? We we do it as often as we're able. Okay. Um, you know, because I'm just curious if there was if we did the RFP process, we might have found someone someone that was cheaper. Is that probable? Uh, probable, but unlikely, since we're we're not even seeing an increase other than postage costs in what we're currently paying. Okay. And with a rate of inflation, that is what it is that really is <laughs> very favorable. Yep. Okay, uh, number seven, Council Member Lou Evanos. Uh, so I know this is for the 22-23 assessment process for landscape district number one. And given the fact that we as a water board just declared, you know, stage four emergency <laughs> drought, um, how is the stage four emergency drought declaration um, impacting the, the costs and the, you know, uh, of this landscape district? Should is have it impacting a it at all? Uh, as we indicated in the report, it should have a positive impact because we'll see redu reduction in water usage and reduction in maintenance costs as uh, turf starts to be replaced. So we're, we're seeing that the, at the end of the day, this should be a positive effect for us. So we're, we're not paying for the change in turf, right? That's being paid for by the district, is that correct? It, it, it'll be paid for through the district, yes. Yes. Okay. And we, and we will make sure, as I'm sure Mr. Pachowski will keep us on our toes, that we are in compliance with our own ordinance, yes? Mm -hmm. We spent quite a bit of time last week changing 200 clocks around the city for uh, timing on water and water usage. So, yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, number eight, Council Member Levinos. I guess I'm going to ask the same question. Was there an RFP or competitive bidding for this project? And if not, why not? Because I didn't see that in the report. The uh, consulting firm that we retained... Um, is that, uh, okay, go ahead, Justin, thank you. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council. Uh, yes, Council Member Lemonos, it was a competitive bidding process. Okay. I would request that in the future that be included in the report so that we know that um, that, that process was gone through so to make sure we're accountable to the taxpayers. Understood. Thank you. Okay, number 10. Wait, can I just ask a quick question? I'm sorry. You want the floor? On that one, just because since she brought it up and I was reading the report and it was very interesting, thank you very much. Um, what does auto R slash W violation mean? It was in, it was on auto right of way violations. Right of way. Thank right of you. Way. Okay, I didn't see that defined. I, thank you. That just, I needed to know that. So your Much excuse appreciated. for the interruption. <laughs> Number ten, <laughs> Council Member Lou Evanos. Well, I, I would like to thank the Mayor Pro Tem for keeping our city accountable. Thank you. Uh, here's my question for um, the resolution. Does I know it's a standby charge in case we want to uh, increase it. But when I looked at the motion, it said that it, it's gone up to 1680. So I guess there was confusion for me on that one. Hold on. So the, the, we are not proposing an increase in the cost from $15.70 per acre, but we are able to increase it if we wanted to, to 1680 per acre which would only generate another $351, which really didn't make a whole lot of sense. But we haven't changed it since 1971? That's correct. Have other cities changed it? I cannot answer that. I just want to see if we're in alignment with what other muni municipalities are doing in, in terms of the standby charge and making sure we're recovering whatever costs we may have associated. We are recovering our costs, but we, can, um, we, didn't ra we haven't raised the rate because we're... Uh, it's really, it's, it's probably more work than it's worth in order to uh, uh, bring in another $350. And as I understand, this only applies to 41 parcels. And in order to truly raise it, you have to, I mean, to make it a, meaning, a meaningful raise, you'd have to go through the... 218 uh, process. 218 process. Right. Yeah. So it's, I just want to make sure, Mr. Deacon, thank you for being here. <laughs> um, is this in alignment with, I mean, 50 years of not having changed of not having changed it, and I hear a lot of residents complaining about, you know, property taxes and whatnot. So 
is this something that uh, will sit well with our residents? So we haven't increased it since 1996. Oh, okay. that was the last time it was increased. Okay, I'm sorry. I was, I was looking at the yep. 1971. So okay, 96. So we collected it in 71. 25 years. Yep. So I changed it in 25 years. So I just want to make sure, and I think you already answered the question that this is covering our costs. Yes. Yeah, we we don't. There are no costs. Okay. Per se. Yep. Okay. okay. Thank you. May I make a motion? Yes, thank you. Uh, two, three, seven, eight, ten. Yes, I'd like to move that we approve consent items two, three, seven, eight, and ten. Second. Call for the vote. Motion passes unanimously. Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council, next on the agenda is item 9A. Authorization for the city manager to execute a contract between the city of Simi Valley and Library Systems and Services, LLC, for the provision of library services through June 30th, 2027. And Anna Medina and Kelly Tinker are here to present this item. Good evening, Mayor Mashburn and members of the City Council. This evening, we have the privilege of presenting the contract proposal from Library Systems and Services, LLC, LSNS, for the continued provision of library services at the Simi Valley Public Library. The day-to-day -day operation of the library has been managed by LSNS since July 1, 2013, and the original contract consisted of an initial five-year term with two additional two-year extension options. The city elected to exercise both extension options with the second two-year extension expiring on June 30th, 2022, completing the city's current agreement with LSNS. City staff requested that LSNS draft a proposal for the continued provision of library services and worked with LSNS in negotiating the terms of the proposed agreement. The proposed contract consists of, of an initial five-year term beginning July 1st, 2022 and concluding June 30th, 2027 and includes the option for two additional two-year extensions. Included in the terms of the proposed agreement are two service level enhancements for the community, the addition of an assistant library director position and an increase in weekly service hours from 55 hours a week up to 58 hours per week. In year one of the proposed contract, total operating expenses would increase by 6% as compared to the final year of the current expiring contract. And the 6% increase includes the costs associated with the additional assistant library director position, as well as the increase in total weekly hours of service to the public. In years two through five of the proposed contract, total operating expense costs would increase by 3% year over year, which is consistent with the current expiring agreement and provides for cost of living adjustments and increases. Since the transition of library services from the Ventura County Library System to LSNS, the community has enjoyed a wide variety of services and programming and access to a robust and relevant collection of print books, digital content, and other media formats available to the public in both English and Spanish. Library staff has continued to emphasize use of the facility as a community gathering space, one that provides opportunity for professional collaboration, recreation, civic engagement, learning and development for all ages and demographics, and a safe and comfortable space for all members of the public to enjoy. LSNS has served as an active partner with the City of Simi Valley, working together to enhance public service and usher the Simi Valley Public Library into the future of library services. Staff recommends that the City Council authorize the City Manager to execute a contract between the City of Simi Valley and Library Systems and Services, LLC, for the provision of library services through June 30th, 2027. This concludes our presentation, and both City staff and LSNS staff are here to answer any available questions. Okay, questions of staff. Councilmember Luevanos. I don't have a question, but I have a comment. So when the time comes for comments, I'd okay. like to make one. Okay. Why don't you go ahead and make your comment now? Uh, I, I and, just, or question, yeah. either. Or. I, I would just like to thank the library staff. It, it, the library is a gem. I am a huge reader, <laughs> as, as is my daughter. Um, and all of the services that are offered by our library are just outstanding. The staff is amazing. Uh, the, the, the thematic, uh, you know, date night with the book. I'm constantly 
bragging to all my other friends who are librarians and other educators about how amazing our library is and embracing the diversity of our culture and addressing Women's History Month and Black History Month and uh, Indigenous History Month. I'm constantly sending teachers and professionals to our Simi Valley website and our social media because you all do just do a phenomenal job. And I really feel like our library is a jewel here. And it's from, you know, in the, in the 21 years that I've lived here, uh, you know, from being pregnant with my babies and raising them, them going off to college, they still, you know, when they come home, they're like, the library, let's go. Um, and then all the other services that you, that you collaborate with, our youth council and our community agencies and the movies. And it truly is a place um, for people of all ages, all of our residents, from little kids and mothers to seniors, um, to just enjoy it. And I just want to thank you because, um, you know, there's other libraries that are banning books and, you know, you just do a phenomenal job and you are the jewel of our city in my eyes as a, as a teacher, as a mother, um, as a Latina. I just want to thank you for all that you do. I just brag on you guys all the time. I just want to tell you at all the conferences I go to. So thank you. Okay. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Litzner. And I concur with all of what she said as far as loving the library and what you do. I do have a question, though, logistically about the contract. Um, I know that um, Councilmember Levinos was just asking about the RFP process and changing, et cetera. So my curiosity is obviously we have had a contract now for nine years. We, and in fact, I met the people at Library Systems and Services at the SCAD conference I was recently at, and they said, we supply your, we do your library. And I thought, I didn't know that. I, th I really felt... I, I, uneducated, but he was very happy to, to say that they were so involved. I guess my question is, and I can't even imagine it because we would never want to lose Kelly, but my question is, is this something that, is there even a consider, is this something you would ever put out to a bid process or change? What does that look like? And I'm not in any way advocating it. It's a curiosity in trying to understand. Does that make sense? Did, would it completely change? In other words, would Kelly go and work for a new company and just, I mean, do, do you, are your assets, does that make sense? The, the people that are currently here, or is it, are, or are those people individually separately contracted? Am I even making sense with my question? So LS&S employs all the staff at the, at the library. So if LS&S was not our contractor, those people would be working elsewhere. Uh, and the only other competitor we're aware of that provides these services is the county of Ventura. Um, but we feel as though we've, um, LSNS has been a true partner with the city of Simi Valley in providing their library services and really responding to the community. Uh, and we really don't think we could have done a whole lot better. And I sense that. Thank you. I just wanted to hear that so that people understand that, that uh, in essence, it is a private company supplying the service, but what a great resource and partnership it is. And I also thought, Kelly, that I was glad to see that you get an assistant director to work, to to do your bidding, if I'm not mistaken. Is that what's written in the contract? <laughs> and, and as I've seen you late at night on the weekends, <laughs> I was thinking, she could probably really use this person. And so I was glad to see that that was written in the contract and to see that the, there was additional three hours a week that's extended. And so those are all very positive things, I think, um, in this contract. And so, yes, so thank you for answering those questions. And, and let's go forward. Much appreciated. Councilmember Kavanaugh. I have a comment, then I'm going to make a motion. Um, Kelly, you and your staff have done a fantastic job, as you've heard from everybody. So I want to thank each and every one of you. And I think we want to keep you guys around. So I would like to move to authorize the city manager to execute a contract between the city of Simi Valley and Library Systems and Services, LLC, for the provision of library services through June 30th, 2027. Second. Okay, we have a motion second. Call for the vote. Motion passes unanimously. Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council, next on the agenda is item 10A, City Council Member Reports. Okay, Council Member Levinos. Uh, we only had a week, so I only have a few meetings. Um, on Wednesday, May 11th, I had the uh, Clean Power Lands Board of Directors meeting where we were discussing, discussing uh, rate setting and risk management. Uh, and, um, you know, we, we are all looking at the fluctuation of energy prices 
and and risk assessment, and as well as you know balancing that with viability of Clean Power Alliance, uh, but making sure that we are meeting all those needs. And so we're going to continue the care um, care program, which is for those of you who are unaware, the care program is a program where you, if you are low income and you would like to have 100% renewable energy, you can do so. Um, and pay the lowest rate, the lower tiered rate, which is still lower than what SoCal Edison charges for power. Uh, so those of you that are low income, but you would like to, uh, you know, help uh, with climate change, with, uh, you know, the environment, you can get 100% renewable energy at the lower cost. It's cheaper than SoCal Edison. So we're going to maintain that, um, that program through the fall, and then we'll see where we are in terms of energy prices. There's a lot of things that impact energy prices. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware, time of use rates will be going into effect very soon for Clean Power Alliance and SoCal Edison. Uh, so, you know, keep an eye out for all the advertisements there and letting you know when it's uh, cheaper to do your laundry and have uh, charge all your cell phones and have all the computers on and just be aware of that. They're typically between 4 and 9 p.m. Um, on Thursday, May 12th, unfortunately, my flight was delayed, so I was unable to uh, go to the Task Force on Homelessness. Um, on Saturday, May 14th, I attended the Ventura County AIDS Walk. Um, for those of you who don't know, there is an uptick uh, in AIDS and HIV um, of 30% in, in the country. Uh, and I was there with uh, Councilman Doug Halter, who was actually um, the first openly gay councilman in Ventura County and also an HIV survivor. So he was a wonderful speaker there and Councilman McDonald. Uh, from the city of Oxnard was also there. So we got to talk to um, uh, the Gilead Foundation, which is still working to find a cure for AIDS and HIV, which we still don't have. So it was a wonderful event. There was a lot of um, LGBTQ um, support groups there, which is wonderful to see. And they were glad to have a representative from the East Ventura County. On Sunday, May 15th, and just so you know, you can still sign up for Girl Scout Day Camp. So Sunday, May 15th was Girl Scout Day Camp training. Um, it is going to be live and in person. Um, and we haven't had it in three years. So those of you that are wondering, what do I do with my little girl and, or my son? Because they also have a sibling camp. So if you have a daughter and a son, you can uh, sign up for the Girl Scout Day Camp. And all the girls that are um, um, PAs and LITs and you know getting all those badges uh, did their training on Sunday, May 15th, including my daughter. So um, just wanted to plug that. If you're looking for activities for your daughter um, and their brother, if you need <laughs> care for their sibling, you can still sign up for Girl Scout Day Camp. And that is my report. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Judge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. On Wednesday, May 11th, I attended or I conducted along with uh, Council Member Kavanaugh the interviews for Neighborhood Council 2. On Thursday, May 12th, I chaired the chair task force on homelessness, and on Saturday, May 14th, I didn't get to attend the ribbon cutting of Mr. Fry's man over there on Tapo Canyon, but I did go afterwards. I went and said hi to the new owners. It looked like a really great spot, and like everybody remember, shop see me first and try to keep your business here. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Next. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. On Wednesday, May 11th, I uh, did the interviews with Council Member Judge. Um, it was very nice. We had uh, six great applicants. And I also had my EDC Executive Board meeting that day. It had moved. It had been moved from the prior week. We have a lot of interesting stuff coming up with the EDC, so I'll try and keep everyone informed. Right now, it's been getting everything lined up um, because of all the new programs and all the new funding and all the new grants that we've gotten. Uh, so... Stay tuned. There'll be great things coming. On Thursday, May 12th, um, as a member of the city, I serve as commissioner for Ventura County Animal Services. So we had our quarterly meeting. Great things are happening at the animal shelter. Anyone that's available this Saturday from 9 to noon, please go down and help them put the dog beds together. We have 208 beds that need to be put together. It was great. They did a, um, an outreach to the community to purchase beds. They said, we need 200 beds. And I, I donated one along with another 207 people. And so they had 208 beds, but now they need to be put together. So from 9 to noon at the animal shelter at Camarillo. And while you're there, you can pick out a new puppy or kitty. because they Well, they didn't have many puppies, but they have lots of kitties. So um, everyone's welcome there, and they would appreciate the help. 
And if you want to donate, you can go on their website at vcas.us. I'm covering all the bases here. Um, on Friday, May 13th, um, oh, wait, I thought I had something else. It was a short week, wasn't it? We didn't have that many. I know. I just wanted to, on Friday, May 13th, I was not able to take off from work, but I wanted to congratulate my son-in-law on being promoted to engineer for Santa, Santa Barbara County Fire. So congratulations, Matt. He'll kill me for mentioning it. So that's all today. Mayor Pro Tem Litzner. Thank you, Mayor. Wednesday, May the 11th, I attended the Veterans Foundation uh, meeting, and they're still looking for the perfect spot to, to put all of their services under one roof, and they're talk, discussing lots of different options. Also attended the Simi Valley uh, Task Force, uh, COVID Recovery Task Force that was kind of established by um, Supervisor Bob Huber's office. I will say I commend um, Linda Swan from our city office, who did a wonderful job reporting and updating on um, some of the actions of this council. Um, that evening, I was involved in, actually, with the Simi Valley Ed Foundation, reviewing and making decisions on coming up with a couple of scholarship recipients for Simi Valley High School. I only mention that because that is probably one of the hardest tasks I have had in a very long time. We have some outstanding, brilliant students that are graduating from our, from our high schools and um, so deserving. Every single one of them was, but I just want to say that uh, this is the time when scholarships are being announced and graduations upon us, and so congratulations to all of you. Thursday, May the 12th, um, I attended the Ventura County Taxpayer Association breakfast where they had an economic outlook for the Ventura County. I, the mayor was there as well, and I will leave it to you to share what Dr. Mike Schne Schneep had to say about our economic outlook, but um, clearly things are changing, but... Um, we just need to be aware of what's going forward. Um, I also attended the VCOG uh, board meeting in Camarillo City Hall. It was fun to see another city hall. Um, and what the whole topic of that conversation was water. And it became very clear that although we are one county, we are under different water purveyors and suppliers, and we have different water concerns. We just do. And one of, the, one of the other water purveyors clearly was talking all about groundwater. And what I recognize is that we as a city and as, as this area need to really start exploring ways to diversify our, our supply. Um, when I, I'm appreciative of the California water aqueduct supply, but it is really our 99% of our source. And we need to maybe explore some other things, but that's a topic for another day. And, and council member... Um, uh, uh, anyway, I, I'm sitting here smiling as I look down at down the down, down, because the two of us had uh, Didi Cavan on. I had a lovely time, and, and that's why I smiled because I see the, the item she forgot. We attended uh, the school district the farewell salute to Superintendent Jason Poplinski that evening at Santa Susana High School. It was just an over the top lovely event, and um, thank you for whoever wrote wrote the commendation resolution. It was well received. And so it was a delight to be there with Didi and to celebrate his retirement and also to welcome Superintendent Hani Yosef, who will be taking will taking the spot. Friday, May the 13th, um, that, that morning I actually had a school visit to Burlwood where I was a guest to watch a classroom as they're doing their rehearsing. I only mentioned this because after the fact, I, met, I, I was introduced after it was all over with, and a couple of the kids wanted to know just what our authority was. And I wasn't there for the discussion, but I'm going back this week. But their question is, does that mean, could she, because we, it was mentioned that we make ordinances and regulations. So does that mean that they could authorize free ice cream for everybody? <laughs> um, and that and the one child said, no, I don't think they can do that. It's not because it's not healthy or something. And, and the teacher was, was not sure. And so I thought it could be a topic... I, what I realize the answer is, if we could budget for it, if I could convince three of my fellow colleagues on this dais to provide a free ice cream day, maybe we could make it happen. But anyway, it was a cute conversation, what our authority is. Um, also on that Friday, I took a tour of Moore Park um, College at the, where they're trying to introduce people to their um, amphitheater that they are designing and, and looking forward to. I understand that you've done that as well, and it was very interesting and educational. Um, that evening, I, I mentioned, um, I attended Rotten Tomatoes at Simi Valley Cultural Arts Center. Fabulous production. Over 30 people in the cast. It's musical. It's, it's amazing you get that many people on stage doing just such incredible work. I encourage everyone here on this dais to go see it. Um, it is, 
it was running it was running for five weeks. The first two weeks were shut because of COVID. There was just two more weeks left. And Friday night, they are choosing not to, to, to um, have a show so that they could have the talent show for our youth council, uh, which is lovely that they're working collaboratively. But that means, I think, that there's five more shows if I'm doing my math right. So just an encouragement to not to miss that. Just great, incredible effort is going on there. Um, Saturday, May 14th, I was able to attend the ribbon cutting for Mr. Fry's. What a fun business that is in our community. Great food. I'll have to get um, council member judges' rec uh, recommend, uh, recommendation for what to order, but it looked like great, great food. Anything you can do with French fries, they're doing it and more. Um, and the, later that day, I actually attended the 50-year anniversary of UCLA's urban planning department, of which I got my master's degree. And it was good just to see all of what's coming out of that institution, but a lots of lots of things and ideas that we discuss come and originate, I think, often from those chambers. But that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be quick with mine. Let's see here. On Tuesday, May 10th, I attended the uh, chamber and the city's EDC. Thank you, Linda Swan, for holding that together and being so thorough. Um, I, I'm sorry I was unable to attend uh, the superintendent of schools retirement, uh, Dr. Poplinski, but I wish him nothing but the best in whatever he does in the future, and I'm pretty sure he's not going to go and sit in front of a TV set. I just have a feeling he's got so much energy, he'll continue on. On Friday, May 13th, I was uh, with the city manager. We uh, met with the folks from the uh, Hummingbird Nest to discuss their entryway and the road widening and uh, different aspects of parking potential problems, uh, addressing problems before they occur. Um, what day did we go to that forecast? That was Thursday, wasn't it, or was it Friday? Uh, for some reason, I don't have it on my calendar. It was, at it, any was, rate, it was Thursday, Thursday, May 12th. Yeah, thank you. The uh, Taxpayers Association over in um, Westlake Hyatt had a uh, presentation of forecast for economic development, and it was a v extremely, what I would call, thorough presentation. And the gentleman, I'm not even going to try to say his name. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I saw. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, hit every topic that you could think of and and gave uh, a report on where things are going or what we're up against right now. And uh, it was very informative, but it's also something that we are seeing day to day. So he put into words something that we're uh, seeing on a regular basis. So I look forward to the... Uh, um, being able to use some of those explanations in future comments and the different EDC meetings that we do. One thing that very, it made it very clear to me that this city and the uh, chamber are doing a very good job of economic development and looking at the uh, future here of uh, Simi Valley. And of course, VC EDC is, you know, how, how do you match what they do? So. Uh, the only other thing I'd like to say real quickly is um, I didn't say anything in comments during the library portion. Uh, I also was so impressed that the increase uh, contract with them was so reasonable and it, it was great and they do such a wonderful job and then see such a minimal increase and and if they keep up the kind of work they're doing today with such a small increase, you know, we can only win. And, of course, the city residents are the real winners. So that's my report. Um, this time we go to new agenda items. So anybody seen none? I have two requests, Mayor. Uh, Scene two. <laughs> uh, the first one is, and I'm not sure if we if we did this last year or not, but I would like to make sure that uh, for next month, we have a proclamation for Juneteenth. 
which is the commemoration of the end of slavery in the United States uh, in Galveston, Texas in 1865. So if we don't already have that, I would like to add that. We're all teed up for that. Yep. Okay. Yeah, didn't we do that last year? We, we did. did. Yeah, I yes. just want to make yeah. sure uh, that we do it again. <clears throat> um, the second request I have is I would like to have uh, staff look into drafting an ordinance banning all city employees from having tattoos or wearing paraphernalia that promotes white supremacy, including 14, SS, and 88, as well as iron cross and other signs or symbols of hate and intolerance while at work or in any capacity representing our city, given the fact that the... Um, uh, assailant was a white neo-Nazi who murdered 10 people in Buffalo, and on his assault rifle, he had the number 14, along with uh, dehumanizing and hateful term for black people, and that our mission statement says we are to deliver excellent service to our community by providing a safe and healthy living environment. This is a way that we can ensure all of our residents know that we truly believe black lives matter, and they will support and protect all of the residents of Simi Valley, regardless of their race, religion, or background, so that something like this does not happen in our city. Looking for a second. Can I ask a question? Do we have uh, currently a any kind of a tattoo policy? Um, obviously, we have policies against hate speech, hatred, etc. We do not, and I would, I think we would need to do a little bit of research on that. I'm not quite sure how far we we could take. I guess that's because I, that, I mean, I understand your It's not any tattoo. It's those specific ones. I understand, I understand what you're saying. I understand your intent. I guess what I'd like to know is have maybe have a report before we draft an ordinance or whatever is maybe just have an understanding of what is legal to, I mean, what is even. I agree. What I, is I even, think it's something because there are a lot of tattoos today, I, I believe, is up to a person's interpretation of what it means. And what it means to me, and what it means to somebody else, what it means to the wearer, uh, and then what is our uh, freedom of speech laws? How do they address it? So I would like to have a thorough uh, understanding of what we're talking about before we make a law that we really don't. I think we we can provide some information to the city council, and if you'd like it to go further than that, you can let us know. And, and we do know that the Constitution does not protect hate speech, so and that's what I'm referring specifically to, uh, symbols of hatred that have been used to, you know, for, for violence, to, to kill people of color. And I would like our residents to know that we don't tolerate that here. We don't want that here, and we're not going to promote it here. Um, and so very specific to what the Anti-Defamation League and the Southern Poverty Law Center um, define as symbols of hatred. Th that's not any tattoo, those specific symbols of hatred that are being used and promoted on social media to murder people of color. I, I think we all agree with you on that. Um, again, I think we need to look into the HR aspects, the, the stuff, but we should be able to do something or talk about it. So We have a history, even a recent history, actually, where someone referred to the... Uh, um, prisoner of war, missing in action flag that flies over the Capitol, I believe, and the White House. And that was declared a uh, oh, racist or something very negative here. And uh, then we learned that it absolutely was not. So I think that it uh, would behoove us to take the time to research exactly what we're talking about before we make an error that we'd be embarrassed over. So. We'll put something there for the council. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Um, we're going to adjourn tonight with the help of council member, Lua, uh, not Lua Lewis, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's uh, Kavanaugh. Uh, uh, actually knows this person uh, a lot better than I do, so it's very appropriate that you give her the send-off. Thank you. I, I wanted to uh, be the person to adjourn our, our meeting tonight in memory of Elfrida Becerra, our former council member, uh, Glenn Becerra's mother, passed away Friday evening. Um, I knew Frida as a, uh, a friend. I met her. This will kind of laugh. We had the farmer's building. When they moved out the farmer's insurance group credit union, she was devastated. 
And so Glenn sent her over to me at the bank, and I took care of her, and so she became my friend from then on. She was the sweetest lady. We would have talks. She'd, even when I moved my office to Westlake, she would stop by every once in a while. And she'd go, oh, I was at the farmer's market, and I brought you some cheese. Or, oh, I was at the farmer's market, and I just wanted to stop and say hi. She was just the nicest, sweetest lady. And I admire her background. She was from Germany, and she met her husband when he was in the military there. And she left her hometown, her home country, to come here and not know anybody except her new husband. And she made a life here, and she made a wonderful life. And Glenn, Glenn wrote a little something that I just wanted to read, just part of what he said. He goes, she was the most amazing mom anyone could have been blessed to have and the strongest, most fearless person I knew. It was her Catholic faith that gave her that strength. She loved to go to the Catholic church, the Latin services. That was her favorite. Um, she raised three lions, meaning his, uh, two boys and a girl, nine cubs, and gave us all strength, determination, faith, and love of family that is the foundation of our lives. And I just thought that was very, those were very nice, wonderful words. But um, Mrs. Becerra, I, actually to her face, I always called her Mrs. Becerra. I guess that's how you learn, right? Um, but she was a loving woman, and I, I'm sorry to see her go, but she left a great legacy in, in her family and in her, and I know because of her faith, she's in heaven and is, and is happy watching over everybody else. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you. And meetings adjourned.